All right, so I think we have a slight bit of a quorum. So while people are still filing in, just going to do some of our brief introductions. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar from New York Gastroenterology Associates. Uh, today, we will be talking about why our stomachs hurt, which I think is a very important topic that I think all of us have experienced. Um, my name is Evgenia Pashinsky. I'm one of the doctors at New York Gastro, and I'll be your faceless voice for this webinar due to a non-functioning camera. Uh, but I am very excited to have two wonderful people present tonight whose lovely smiling faces you are able to see. So on the medical side of things, we have um, Dr. Anthony Weiss. Uh, he's an assistant professor of medicine and gastroenterology at Mount Sinai and has been in practice for 30 years, even though he does not look it. So he's certainly seen uh, a couple of these stomach ache situations. Um, and on the dietary front is Susie Finkel, who is one of our amazing uh, registered dietitians. She specializes in gastrointestinal nutrition and works with our patients on the dietary management of digestive symptoms and diseases, including the issues that we'll be discussing today. Um, she holds a Master of Science in Nutrition from Columbia University and is accredited by the National Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Uh, she's also a guest lecturer at Columbia's Graduate Nutrition Program and a digestive health writer for multiple publications such as WebMD and Very Well Health. So some pretty awesome presenters you have today. And uh, just some housekeeping stuff before they start um, educating us. Um, as usual, there's always a presentation uh, followed by a Q&A session. So um, please any ask any questions that you may have in the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting. Um, keep in mind that many questions will be answered as the talk goes on, um, and myself and Susie will be asking, answering, sorry, answering some of these along the way as well. Um, also keep in mind that anything that's very particular or specific to your personal medical care uh, should be saved for a discussion with your uh, physician. Um, and with that, um, I will be handing it over to our presenters. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Yevgenia. And uh, Evgeny and uh, Susie and myself are very happy to be talking to you today about what is a very, may seem a very simple but and common problem, but we certainly see a lot of it. And uh, basically stomach aches or tummy aches, the fancy word for that, uh, we doctors call it dyspepsia. Um, but we'd like to just spend some time giving you an overview of how we approach this and what's involved and what uh, the diagnostic possibilities are and how we approach the making that diagnosis with you and how we manage it with you. So dyspepsia, what is it? What causes it? And how do you treat it? Um, so basically we define it, what we're talking about today is people that have chronic pain up located to the upper abdomen uh, between the belly button and the, the xiphoid process, which is that little bone at the bottom of your chest. Um, and basically for the purpose of this talk, we're not talking about reflux, but heartburn symptoms, uh, that's a different uh, subject. Uh, so we're just talking about people who have kind of pain in that upper abdominal area. Very common when you do health surveys uh, and you ask the general population, 10 to 13% of people will have these symptoms, you know, at least once in a while, once in a while, I mean, a couple of times a month at least, or sometimes more chronic. And in the primary care world, the general docs, that may be about two to 5% of reasons actually people go to see their doctor and probably a higher percentage of them are referred to us after that. So we probably, I would say it's, you know, certainly a big part of what we do. Um, so what is it exactly? And uh, when it's looked at, this is just the punchline, so you speak, what, what happens when we make a diagnosis and we do evaluation, what does it turn out to be? So even though I said reflux is not a big part of it, still, when we say do an endoscopy, we'll find five to 15% of people, you know, do have inflammation of their esophagus or esophagitis as the cause of that pain. So that's something um, that we will treat at the time. Um, and five or 15% of people will actually have an ulcer and I'll Go, we'll go into more detail explaining what exactly is an ulcer and how that's managed. Um, but for, fortunately for us, very few people who come to us with these sort of complaints have cancer or malignancies. It's certainly less than 1%. Uh, but the biggest proportion of what we deal with the most, 70 to 90%, have what we call non-ulcer dyspepsia, which means you have 
these sort of upper abdominal symptoms and you don't have an ulcer. So what does that mean? It means it's basically one of two things. You have some type of irritation of the lining of your stomach and that can be caused by gastritis. And a very important part of that is treating a bacteria called H. pylori, which we'll talk about more, of course. And then a lot of people have basically stomachs that don't look that bad or just have a little irritation or perhaps nothing. And we call that functional dyspepsia. And so we'll spend some time talking about what that is and how we manage that as well. So the way I always try to uh, define gastritis or stomach irritation uh, to people is to basically say that you have to realize that your stomach is basically a big bag of acid protected by a layer of slimy bicarbonate. So this is a little cross section of what your stomach might look like under a microscope. This would be the contents of your stomach up here where it's full of acid and liquid. And then there's this layer of a gel that your stomach makes, which also secretes bicarbonate, which actually protects, protects the stomach lining from all that acid. And when people get into trouble and get symptoms, it's when something breaks down the lining of the stomach, allowing the chemicals in the acid in the stomach uh, to actually then damage the lining of the stomach. And that can be a variety of things. It can be medications, it can be bacteria, but that's underlying what is a gastritis. And this would be a picture, if you look on the left, I, maybe you'll have to take my word for it because you don't look at this as much as we do, but basically on your left, you have a nice healthy stomach, you see these nice healthy folds, it's kind of pink, it's kind of smoothy, and that's a normal stomach. But when the lining gets broken down and gets damaged, then you get this, what it looks like on the right, there's this kind of shaggy, irregular red. Maybe you can appreciate with me that the areas are eroded and broken down. And certainly that can be a very uncomfortable situation when that happens. So we talk about gastritis, what are the causes? Um, there's kind of the big two, which account for a big chunk of it. Uh, and that's infection, mainly a, this H. pylori bacteria, which we'll talk about in more detail. And then also medications are by far the most common being about um, anti-inflammatory medications. Those are medications that you take for headaches, arthritis, um, you know, muscle aches, basically those things, Advil, Motrin, Aleve, and they have a, they're referred to as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And they're a major cause of damage to the lining of the stomach. So together, H. pylori and non-steroidals maybe account for you know, 60 to 85% of um, the causes of gastritis. But then, you know, when it's not those, there's probably, you know, dozens if not over 100 of different things that can break down your and irritate the lining of the stomach. Um, it might be other medications that are irritating, certain antibiotics, potassium, for example. Um, there might be other nonspecific infections you get. This might be the result of a food poisoning or gastroenteritis that leaves the lining of your stomach damaged. There's a lot of other things that can be irritating or certainly not maybe by themselves, but as a cofactor, uh, alcohol, it can be irritating to the stomach. Smoking can definitely contribute to breaking down the lining of the stomach. You know, and stress, I would never say that stress is the sole cause of anything, but certainly we know that stress can aggravate underlying disorders of the stomach and 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 you also create you know epinephrine and other neuroactive hormones that will make you more sensitive and aggravate the inflammatory process and then there's a whole bunch of other systemic illnesses or autoimmune conditions which could also result in damage to the lining of the stomach so there's the big two and then there's a lot of other little things that it can be um and then the next step is if gastritis or the lining of your stomach gets broken down, you may actually form something called an ulcer. And what is an ulcer? Basically, it's, you might think of it as gastritis going wild. Basically, the lining of the stomach has gotten so eroded that you actually form a deep sore in the lining of the stomach. And the symptoms can be uh, similar to um, those you might have of gastritis, uh, more prone to complications, uh, they can cause bleeding, they can actually rarely cause perforation, and sometimes might lead to surgery. Fortunately, we don't see as many ulcers as we did, say, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, I think because a lot of over-the-counter medications are, are on the market that didn't exist back then, so a lot of people wind up getting treatment or self-treating, so it doesn't get that bad that we don't see as many ulcers as we have in the past. 
but every once in a while, we will definitely see people with bad ulcers. And uh, once in a while, you may even hear uh, about somebody well-known who has an ulcer. Uh, for example, you may have read that last fall, Bruce Springsteen, who was about to go on a world tour, had to cancel it because he was found to have an ulcer and needed time to rest and recuperate. So socially very important disease. So outside of gastritis and um, ulcers, what are uh, is functional dyspepsia? And that's a more complicated topic. Uh, you know, so those people who have symptoms of upper abdominal pain, like we described, then we go in and there's not much inflammation there. Maybe it even looks normal. Um, and there's probably no one cause of this, but it generally falls into uh, several different categories. One might be kind of a motility muscle or nerve problem. And I always also like to tell people that basically, if you think about it, your GI tract is one long muscular tube. And, you know, in addition to digesting food, it has the job of pushing food from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom uh, through your GI tract. And sometimes these muscles don't work the way they should, just like you might get a Charlie horse or an injured muscle. Maybe the muscles of the stomach, whose job is to churn up food to help you digest it, aren't contracting or peristalsing the way they should be, and that can cause discomfort. And that might be a, due a, a underlying issue with your muscles being a little bit more irritable, or maybe the nerve lining that stimulates and controls, regulates how the stomach moves, uh, is thus not working the way it should in ways we don't understand. There's also this concept in GI illnesses when we don't see a lot of actual damage of what we call pain sensitivity. Uh, the fancy phrase we have for that is called visceral hyperalgesia. And that just means your viscera or your gut somehow is more sensitive to normal stimuli that say the next person may not find bothersome. And this may be the result of a hyperactive nervous system. It might be a result of something you're left with after your stomach has been damaged or irritated. Uh, and that's something that can be managed some people may have low-level infections that we're not appreciating, even though the stomach looked normal, some type of infection. Um, so there's a lot of possible mechanisms why someone might have stomach discomfort. And of course, psychological components, when, bo when your body is under stress, your, you know, your, your gut doesn't live in a vacuum, it's a part of your whole life, uh, and everything that affects your life may affect your stomach as well. Uh, some people, you know, they have headaches when they are under stress and back pain, and some people, the stomach gets disproportionately effect, affected. So all these things have to be taken into account. Um, for, pra for research purposes, and to a certain degree for uh, treatment purposes, we'll often try and kind of define the nature of the person's symptoms and helping us approach it. Uh, this is a slide from something called the Rome Foundation, which is an international group that works with people that have what's called functional disorders or functional dyspepsia. And they like to classify people with stomach uh, upset, or stomach symptoms into two categories. One is called the postprandial distress syndrome. And those are people whose symptoms are mainly excess fullness after eating or early satiety, feeling full with not eating a lot. And the other people have more of what they call the epigastric pain syndrome. And those are people that have more just burning and sharper pain in that area. And certainly they're not mutually exclusive. There may be some um, overlap, but sometimes this is useful for us to think about uh, people's symptoms this way because it does sometimes have implications as to what medications or treatments they're more likely to respond to. So, what do we do and how are we going to try and approach and figure out what the problem is? Of course, the cornerstone of any evaluation when people come to us with these symptoms is a good history and physical, examining you, uh, making sure it is the thing we think it is, it's related to a stomach condition and not something else, uh, learning what medications you're on, what other conditions you have. Um, stool and we often, when people have these symptoms, very quickly want to test and treat for H. pylori uh, bacteria because that's something finite that we can treat. And there's several ways we can do that in a relatively non-invasive way. Um, we can do that through a breath test, for example, or a stool sample and see whether you have that bacteria or not. 
Um, blood tests we'll sometimes do if we're worried the patient uh, is maybe a little bit sicker. We want to make sure they're not anemic or exclude other conditions like a liver problem. And oftentimes we will do an endoscopy. And an endoscopy, of course, is a procedure where we'll actually put an instrument through your mouth with a camera on it to actually look at the stomach itself. Most of the time, with most people, we can treat basically just with a good history of physical and testing for H. pylori will go a long way towards helping us figuring out and understanding the problem. And generally, as a rule, uh, we won't d jump to endoscopy unless uh, you know somebody's symptoms are rather severe, such as weight loss, you know, something obviously like vomiting blood or tarry black stools, which might indicate that you're bleeding internally. We tend to, as per our guidelines from our medical societies, do endoscopies in people over the age of 60, just because unfortunately, I'm 62 as we all get older, we tend to have more problems that need to be looked at maybe a little bit more carefully. And of course, if you don't respond to our treatment, then of course, uh, we'll do an endoscopy just to establish and see what's going on. There are some other tests that we, you can do which are kind of ancillary. Uh, a sonogram might be good for looking to gallstone disease or gallbladder disease. Uh, if you think that your uh, um, symptoms are leading to that regard, though usually we can separate these out on a history and physical. Uh, CAT scan, again, if it's another way of doing a more uh, thorough examination if you're not responding to treatment or if your symptoms don't quite add up to us, we wanna see what else is going on. Um, so really at the end of the day, how do you treat um, these conditions? Uh, so if you have a gastritis or an ulcer, um, it's certainly relatively straightforward. You wanna, of course, first identify and treat the underlying cause, which I said before, uh, identify if H. pylori is there, uh, stop the anti-inflammatory medications or other medications that might be irritating them, see how you respond. Uh, and Susie, of course, is gonna help us about diet because diet is a huge part of treating this, excuse me. And then also there are medications. And for people with gastritis and ulcer-like symptoms, um, you know, basically what we want to do is reduce or block acid. Even though I said before that acid is not the cause of the problem, it's your stomach. It's kind of an erosion of the lining of the stomach. So the acid gets there and does damage. But reducing or blocking the acid will allow the stomach to heal and repair itself. And there are other medications that without reducing acid can also kind of coat the stomach and repair the lining of the stomach as well. And those are roughly the two categories of medications we use I'll go into those in a little bit more detail in a minute. And then people who have the functional dyspepsia, the people with these symptoms, um, where we don't see a lot going on, it gets a little bit more nuanced. Um, and again, that's where the differentiation, with, differentiation, whether your symptoms are more burning and epigastric pain versus bloating and fullness may play a role. So a lot of the medications we use to treat this, uh, ulcers and gastritis are very effective for treating uh, dyspepsia or, you know, a stomach that doesn't look too bad, if the symptoms are ulcer-like, if there's burning and epigastric pain, uh, the people that tend to have primarily kind of fullness and bloating, uh, they won't necessarily respond as well to those medications. And in those people, in addition to the above treatments, we really have to look at things to reduce the sensation of bloating and gas and managing that and decreasing cramps and spasm. So just to go over, again, I keep talking about this NSAIDs, Motor, and Advil, just to let you know how big a problem they are. They're taken by up to 11% of the population on a regular basis. And actually, if you were to bother to look, you would find ulcers develop uh, asymptomatically in as many as 25% of people who use these chronically. Uh, most people actually don't even have that much symptoms, but if you were to bother to look, you'd see ulcers there. But a certain percentage of them will become symptomatic and have significant complications of bleeding or perforation. And it's actually a tribute that maybe seven or 10,000 people a year can die from complications of medications like Advil and Motrin or Leave. So they're not benign. We actually have guidelines that the people that have to take these medications on a regular basis, that they actually may have to take another medication to protect their stomach at the same time. And then other medications that you can use Again, if we're just trying to reduce or block acid, there's a lot of over-the-counter medications that will just kind of absorb 
and neutralize the acid, and you can see them everywhere. Uh, any Dwayne Reed or CVS, uh, Tums and Mylanta, they tend to be one of two things, either an aluminum or magnesium component, which absorbs acid, um, and they do well. Their major side effect is diarrhea, or you can take something that's got calcium in it, which also buffers the acid. They have the opposite effect. They can tend to be a little more constipating, so that might if you have an issue or tendency towards constipation, might guide us into recommending something one over the other. Um, these medications are pretty well tolerated and safe to take. Um, the only really caveats we have in them uh, is there may be issues if you're taking other medications that they might interfere with the absorption of. Um, and if you were to have significant kidney disease and you're taking a lot of calcium or magnesium, uh, that might be something we'd have to pay attention to because uh, your kidney may not process them as well. There's a lot of over-the-counter medications I like also that can kind of coat and uh, the stomach can create a barrier to kind of like a Band-Aid for your stomach to let it heal itself rather than just neutralize the acid. This is a medication that's actually, I like to use, it's basically licorice, uh, not the candy licorice with the sugar, but the actual licorice root itself is mostly sold as something called DGL. And it's been used you know, for hundreds of years for these sort of stomach uh, ailments, and they can be very effective. The major complication or ir uh, problem with this is occasionally people have a tendency to retain a little water, but certainly something I, I will try with people. And then, of course, we actually have prescription medications, though a lot of them are also over the counter now, uh, that can actually turn off the stomach produ production in the stomach. And this is just a very quick physiology lesson. Um, you have a cell in your stomach called the parietal cell that makes uh, acid, and several things stimulate um, this cell to make acid. One is histamine, which is a chemical that your body will release that tells the stomach it's time to make acid. So we have medications that can block that production, and those are called H2 receptor blockers. And then there's medications that actually block this little pump here called the proton pump, which is the actual mechanism by which the parietal cell puts the acid into the stomach environment. And those medications are called proton pump inhibitors. And you're probably familiar with a lot of them because even though they started out as over as prescription medications, they're also available over the counter. So the major histamine receptor blocker we have these days is called famotidine or Pepsid. And it's been around for over 50 years. It can heal an ulcer usually in eight weeks, about 60 to 7% of our time. That's a kind of our benchmark for how effective it is. Uh, it's got an excellent safety profile. It's well absorbed. It's not affected by food. And it's a good medication that you can take or maybe prescribed to you by your doctor because you can also get it as a prescription. Um, and then our strongest medication uh, for reducing acid production is the proton pump inhibitor. And that's the infamous Prilosec, Nexium, uh, Dexalent, Prevacid. There's a bunch of them. Uh, and they've been around for close to 25 or 30 years now, they're much more powerful in reducing acid and generally lead to faster healing rates and higher healing rates. So as opposed to healing an ulcer 60 or 70% of the time, uh, these type of medications in eight weeks will heal an ulcer up to 90% of the time. Uh, they're generally pretty well tolerated. Um, and you can take them generally 20 minutes before a meal once a day is usually very effective. So these medications can be used long-term, but there has been some concern with prolonged use. And we can't, I can't talk about all the possible purported or proposed side effects of long-term use of these medications, because that in itself would be a, a talk of several hours. Uh, suffice to say, they have been a lot of concern anytime you take a strong antacid for a long-term period of time, there might be any one of potential side effects I can only say that when you really look and hone down at these use of these medications long term, any theoretical side effects are usually pretty overstated and don't apply to most people. So especially if you have an indication to use this medication, they can be used if necessary long term. Obviously, you have to look at the underlying condition you have and look at the risk benefit like you would with any medication. And of course, you want to use the lowest possible dose and the least medication as possible. But many people can will need to use these medications on a long term, if not ongoing basis, and uh, and they're and they're really okay. And uh, 
again, I, I wish we had more time to talk about it. There are several position papers that you can look at online from the American Gastroenterology Association and the American uh, uh, College of Gastroenterology. Um, but I'll be happy to answer questions about those at the end after Susie talks. Um, uh, there are a couple other medications that we can use that are prescription that rather than reduce acid, kind of help the stomach heal itself by kind of forming a coating over the lining of the stomach. One of the more common ones is caraphate, which forms like an aluminum sulfate gel uh, that can coat the stomach and allow the stomach to repair itself without necessarily reducing the acid. And interesting, you probably don't knew, know this. Uh, uh, some of you may know that mesoprostol is a drug that's used actually to help terminate pregnancies uh, as a prescription medication. But a lot of people don't know that was originally developed as an ulcer medication. Uh, and it does work for ulcers, but it's not our most effective medication. A lot of people get diarrhea with it. But in some cases, when we have a really uh, tough situation where people are having a lot of trouble, this is a medication that can be considered under the proper circumstances. Um, so the people that have more of the bloating, the postprandial fullness, again, that's a harder situation if the symptoms aren't clearly burning and epigastric pain. Uh, we can try the same things we try for those people, um, suppressing acid, getting rid of H. pylori. Uh, the big part of this is going to be dietary, smaller, more frequent meals, uh, low-fat meals, uh, things like a FODMAPS diet, which Susie may touch on. There are some over-counter medications that can be very helpful with them for these symptoms as well. Um, Carmidas, which are medications that have a lot of, uh, I mean, herbal agents that have uh, carmidas. These are things like fennel, anise, certain essential oils, and sometimes probiotics under the right circumstances are help helpful. These become a little bit more specific as we get to know more about you in your case. Uh, but these are all things which we can use and often uh, with our patients help improve their symptoms. So I want to just talk a little bit before I wrap this up and um, give it to Susie and then take your questions about the H. pylori, because I've mentioned it several times. So H. pylori is a bacteria. It's the most common bacterial infection in the world. Uh, about 50% of people in the world have it. Um, it's spread through food and through water. So you can pass it that way very easily. Uh, it varies. Uh, areas, Some areas of the world have it to a much higher degree than others. Uh, it can be as high as 80 or 90% in less developed countries, Southeast Asia, Asia, uh, South America. In the United States, still about 30% of people have it. Uh, and, you know, literally half the world that has it, and most people don't get that sick from it, it just kind of sits there uh, and doesn't bother you. But it does bother enough people when it becomes a problem that it can cause a tremendous amount of gastrointestinal condition. It's a major cause of ulcer disease and gastritis. And the World Health Org Organization uh, says it actually may be responsible for about 50% of all the gastric cancer in the world. So certainly an important organism. Um, it's kind of interesting uh, that how bacteria can live in the stomach because, as I mentioned before, it's a very hostile environment. It's extremely acidic in there. It's uh, Imagine a stomach, any sort of bacteria that can um, survive in battery acid, and that's what you're talking about. Uh, and it does it through various ingenious ways. It has these long tail called flagella, which can let it bur bur burrow down into the mucus bicarbonate layer of the stomach to get away from the acid. It has these little molecules that help it attach to the cell so it doesn't get swept away. And it actually has this enzyme called urease, which actually um, neutralizes acid and creates this cloud of like ammonia, which is a uh, alkaline substitus, substance that sits in this alkaline cloud to protect it from its acid. So it can sit there and it can literally survive in your stomach for years and years. And why some people it starts to cause problems and irritate the stomach and cause damage um, is really not really well understood. Um, it has something to do with acu activating certain toxins that cause it to damage and destroy the cells that line your stomach. Um, it's kind of an interesting story, just as a side note, uh, that this bacteria was actually, quote unquote, discovered in 1984. It had been sitting in the stomach and had been there 
obviously, uh, probably for thousands of years and in, infecting people, studies have shown when they go back and look at samples from that far ago. But um, no one actually first saw it was there or recognized it was a pathogen until 1984, a young scientist in Australia began studying it and um, proposed that this was a cause of ulcer disease and damage to the stomach. And he was not met very kindly by the medical establishment at the time who kind of mocked him. And he actually did something very interesting that he got so upset from the international meetings that he actually went back to Australia and he drank a cup of broth with this bacteria and proved that it caused uh, ulcers. And then, of course, it became very well established. This was, in fact, a major cause of stomach damage. And this young guy, whose name was Barry Marshall, actually got the Nobel Prize. And I came across this slide of his uh, um, a few years ago, that when they actually started making drugs to treat H. pylori, uh, one of the companies that made the antibiotics to treat H. pylori uh, commissioned a famous cartoonist by the name of Spike Lee. I'm not Spike Lee, I'm sorry, Stan Lee. Spike Lee is a different artist, but Sp Stan Lee is a very famous cartoonist who was uh, did all the Marvel characters and did Spider-Man. And he actually did this little cartoon showing uh, Barry Marshall ingesting the bacteria to prove that it caused ulcers. So when I usually show this slide to uh, our medical students, I would actually ask them, you know, what are you more impressed by, the fact that he was given a Nobel Peace Prize or did he, or the fact that he was drawn as a cartoon character by Stan Lee? And I think it's like 50-50 over which the students are more excited about. So that's the story of the H. pylori. Um, so if it's in everybody's stomach, um, does everybody need to be treated? So there are clear indications when somebody really needs to be treated for it. Um, it's very clear that if you obviously you have an ulcer disease or a history of ulcer disease, this treat this bacteria should be treated and eradicated. There actually is a very um, rare lymphoma called a malt lymphoma, which is actually caused by this H. pylori and can be completely cured by treating it. So that's another clear indication. Um, Sometimes, it, as I said before, it actually is associated with increased risk of gastric cancer. Um, so it's been shown early on in Japan uh, where they do a lot of endoscopy for early gastric cancer that if you find and remove a stomach cancer and you get rid of the H. pylori, the cancer will not recur, whereas if you leave the bacteria there, it will recur. So it's very clear that it plays a role in gastric cancer. And again, this large number of people out there who have, quote unquote, functional dyspepsia, uh, achy stomachs or irritated stomachs, where we're not seeing much, but H. pylori is there. It's clear that a, a percentage of people who have this condition will um, benefit from getting rid of the H. pylori. So that's a clear indication to treat it. Um, there's a lot of other potential uh, indications which were more controversial, but more accepted. So if you are taking a lot of anti-inflammatory medications or aspirin, um, and you have to be on them and you're worried about stomach irritation or, or long-term complications of these medications damaging your stomach. If you have H. pylori, it should be treated and you should get rid of it. Uh, it's actually been associated because it can actually interfere with absorption of iron and B12, that if you have low B12 or low iron and there's no other uh, explanation that you should get rid of the H. pylori. And we're becoming more and more uh, aware of its potential to uh, reduce the incidence of getting cancer of the stomach if you get rid of it, if there's if you come from an area where there's a high risk, or if you have a family history of stomach cancer, and maybe even if you don't, that and you have it, it's probably worth getting rid of it. Uh, certainly if it's got to the point where it's causing symptoms enough for us to evaluate and determine that you have it. Uh, the treatment for H. pylori is complicated and involves uh, a, usually a strong combination of antibiotic and antacids for a period of at least several weeks. And that you know, I'm not going to and talk about that, but I will answer specific questions about that if you have it. Generally, if I have somebody who's H. pylori and I want to treat them, I usually have them come in and go over the treatment with them in detail because it can be quite complicated. So that's all I'm going to say for now. I'm hoping you can appreciate that uh, us at New York Gastroenterology Associations are committed to helping you treat and have a happier stomach. And a big part of that, of course, is working with our wonderful nutritionists. And I'm going to turn this over now uh, to Susie Finkel, who's going to help us 
uh, educate us about how diet can be helpful and help treat and cure these conditions as well. So I'm just gonna quickly come out of this slideshow and if you bear with me for one second, I'll bring up your slides, uh, Susie, and then you'll just cue me as when you want to me to advance them. Perfect, did it. It's always touch and go with our technology. So, so far so yeah. good. Um, all right, so talking about the role of nutrition with the upper GI issues that Dr. Weiss mentioned, um, you know, it's really fascinating because as I'm going to talk about some of the things that we can use to make you feel better probably aren't what you might expect. And I think it's generally surprising and relieving for a good number of my patients with gastritis or ulcers or dyspepsia to hear the strategies that we have. Um, I feel like I see this spectrum of perception of nutrition with this. There's people that are kind of at one end thinking that extremely restrictive diet is necessary. And then there's the other end of the spectrum thinking that diet is completely irrelevant. And as with most things, the answer lies somewhere in the middle, which I'll talk about. Um, but, you know, it's possible that if you're not symptomatic at all, there may not be such a significant role of nutrition, whereas in some, you know, more rare cases, nutrition can be really the, the center of the show if there's heavy alcohol intake or food allergies or nutritional supplements that are kind of the culprit. Um, but for the most part with gastritis and active ulcers and functional dyspepsia, diet is one of the tools that we have to use con in conjunction with uh, medical therapy to get you feeling better. And diet in this way can help regulate pH levels in the stomach. It can reduce irritation. We can use it to regulate stomach acid, um, stomach stretch and symptoms like bloating and pressure and pain sensations. So we have multiple kind of options that we know to be quite effective. Um, and I'll go over a few of them. Next slide. Sorry, wait. Got it. Perfect. Um, so if you're struggling with symptoms, a few things I'll touch on that may help get you feeling better. Um, I think I could turn this this list probably into an acronym here because there's the T's, but there's no vowels to make it a word. So let's just call it three, T, three T's and a C. We, lo we love an acronym in healthcare. But anyway, um, the first T, uh, timing, you know, with your eating schedule and eating habits, that's going to be relevant. The second T is texture, meaning the physical property of what you're putting down the tube. Third T, thinking about the potential triggers for, um, you know, your symptoms, things that you'll want to watch out for. Um, and lastly, that C for customization, really want to identify what works best for you in particular, because everything with diet is so individualized. So this could look very different from your sister, your neighbor, your friend. So we'll really want to always be thinking about what in particular is going on with you. Next slide. So timing, really thinking about your meal schedule as a tool here to manage symptoms. Um, and a meal schedule that'll probably feel best for gastritis, ulcers, and functional dyspepsia is really focused on distributing the eating times throughout the day. Um, small but frequent meals, this is really helpful to buffer stomach acid and also regulate stomach stretch through the day so that we prevent symptoms like a burning sensation, pressure, bloating, or general upper GI discomfort. My favorite easy GI motto to remember that I repeat constantly. So if you're a patient of mine on here tonight, you've probably heard me say it. You have some of these complaints, but an empty stomach is an acid stomach. So when we go a long time without eating, we can have this buildup of accumulated stomach acid, which may feel not that great if you have active gastritis or an ulcer um, or suffer from acid reflux. And at the same time, we also don't want the stomach to be really contracted through the day and then have this sudden exaggerated stretch from a later meal. That's sometimes what I describe as the Thanksgiving phenomenon where everybody's 
fasting through the day. They're skipping breakfast. They're waiting until this, you know, big, delicious meal, but the stomach is contracted. And then all of a sudden there's this big poof and a large volume, and it tends to not bode so well. So we really want to have more even, you know, eating increments through the day um, to try to prevent those symptoms. Um, so that's you know, avoiding skipping breakfast, avoiding having infrequent meals, long fasting stretches, big volumes coming all at once. These are all things that we can modify to see what you feel better with. Sometimes just adding breakfast and a more evenly distributed food portioning through the day makes a huge difference. Next slide. So also another tool here, food texture, super interesting for symptom management. And it really is kind of intuitive. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it. If you imagine the stomach as this blender, right? It's like churning and grinding everything up with acidic fluid. So if you put something bulky into a blender, we're thinking like, what's gonna happen? It's gonna take longer and more of that acidic fluid to puree it up for the next phase of digestion. Versus if you put softer textures into that blender, we can actually clear things faster, which means less acid to process it. So imagine putting in something like whole nuts into a blender versus some smooth nut butter. That nut butter is going to get processed faster, and we like that for symptom control. So thinking about these bulky textures also with taking up a lot of real estate in the stomach, right? Like they take up a lot of space, and that's really more relevant to the stretch of the stomach because the stomach's doing these two fancy jobs. It's blending and churning, but it's also stretching and contracting through the day. So essentially prioritizing some of those softer foods is a more consolidated kind of lower volume texture, but you can still take in the same general nutrition. So thinking about things like ripe skinless fruits, well-cooked vegetables, smooth nut butters, soups, smoothies, tender things. Um, I'll say moist and mushy, <laughs> less appetizing, but that's the reality of some of the textures we're going for um, if you're really not, not feeling so good. And that can be helpful for bloating and pain. Um, the raw bulky textures, we want to try to break that down as much as possible just to be really kind to your stomach. Next slide. So, you know, lastly, I want to think about talk about the individual food triggers for upper GI issues. And there's a variety of them. There's a variety of potential gastric irritants that may or may not be triggers for you, right? So there's no kind of universal, but they're things that we want to be cautious of because we know they have the potential to exacerbate symptoms of gastritis and active ulcers and chronic dyspepsia. In reality, diet doesn't cause gastritis. It doesn't cause stomach ulcers, which was the old thinking that something like spicy foods or acidic foods could directly cause those conditions. But what we know now is they may not feel great if you have those active conditions. So we want to be mindful of consuming them and sort of learn what makes you feel good versus not. Um, and so that can count for things like spicy foods, uh, very fatty foods, things that are greasy and fried, very acidic foods and beverages, like coffee and citrus, alcohol, big portions of food in general, and things that are also voluminous, right? Like I just mentioned, things that are bulky in texture, things taking up a lot of that real estate in the stomach. Um, all of those foods have the potential to aggravate symptoms, either because they can kind of irritate an already irritated stomach, or they can trigger an irritable stomach. They can lower pH in the stomach, or they can slow down stomach emptying time, which we're trying to avoid. But there's good news about, you know, food triggers, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, so really before you think about, you know, that list, if that looked alarming for a second, um, we want to identify what you can tolerate in a certain context, right? So there are actually ways that we can avoid eliminating any of these trigger foods and figure out, is there a way we can kind of include a smaller portion, a, a certain uh, combination of that food that might feel best? 
And that's kind of really part of my, my job as a nutritionist is to help you tolerate the most foods possible, not to restrict the most foods possible. So I really like to emphasize that because there's so many lists of foods uh, that that are on the internet that you're told to, you know, just get rid of your diet. And it feels like this is an, you know, an indefinite plan. Um, and that really shouldn't be because how you consume a potential trigger can really affect how you tolerate it. So for example, we can experiment with a smaller portion of a potential potential trigger, we could pair it with a balanced meal, like coffee after or even with breakfast versus on an empty stomach. You could try being in a monogamous relationship with that trigger food, right? Like not multiple potential triggers at once, no polyamory with the coffee and grapefruit and a spicy tomato sauce and like another potential trigger at that breakfast, but like, let's just try one at a time. So it, we see how it feels with some safer options. Um, so the context is really uh, crucial here and the nutrition team can guide you with this if you're not really sure what you're tolerating versus not. Next slide. So just to quickly summarize, if you've been diagnosed with any of the conditions Dr. Weiss was discussing or you're having upper GI symptoms, we have multiple strategies to try, including um, working on eating schedules, texture, identifying potential irritants, ways to prevent symptoms with them. And I'll just emphasize again that there's a lot of customization here. So no one size fits all uh, diet. And we just want to be really cautious of restrictive diets or lists that you might find out in the world or that someone may have given to you that's not a gastrointestinal specialized dietitian because they may not be super necessary for you or probably not very fun at all. So it's really just important to focus on your particular symptoms and responses to foods. So we'll take some questions. Next slide. So amazing, amazing talk with lots of very useful information, you guys. Um, and there's been a lot of questions sort of coming through. Um, I'll ask some of the highlights of some questions for uh, for Dr. Weiss. Um, patients have asked, you know, is it okay or can you take both a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, and a fibotidine, an H2 blocker um, at the same time, sort of concurrently? And kind of what where would that be a scenario? So sometimes you might need extra acid suppression than either one of them can do, and they can be used um, in the same patient. The thing is you wouldn't take them exactly the same time. There's a certain physiology of how the PPIs work where they basically work better in the morning when you're taking them and acid is being stimulated. And theoretically, if you took the PPI and the H2 block together, they actually might not work as well. When it's actually been looked at, uh, what the most effective combination of uh, those two medications reducing acid, there actually were studies done about 30 years ago by a man named Donald Castell, who actually experimented on a bunch of medical students, and he put pH monitors in them uh, and measured their acid through the course of a day on various combinations. He found the best combination of the two was to take the proton pump inhibitor in the morning or even twice a day if you needed it to before breakfast, before dinner, and then take the famotidine at bedtime. And that combination gave you the most significant uh, and prolonged effective acid depression if that was really your goal. Uh, so you can take them. I usually separate them out. Usually the proton pump in the morning and the famotidine in the evening. And Based on that data and my own personal experience, that will work. I've often had patients come and taking both at the same time and are not getting the benefit and separating them out will help. And I think so. So two important takeaways is, you know, yes, it is safe um, and sometimes needed. And um, the goal for all of us is always to have, you know, the shortest course of the lowest dose drug or any of these that we can but it's not at the compromise of making, uh, you know, making the patient suffer in the process just to get off medication. Um, and also uh, of note, we are, you know, we don't experiment on med students anymore. So rest assured that that's a thing of the past, yes. Um, and then the other question for Dr. Weiss was um, kind of defining what is considered long-term use when it comes to taking PPIs. Uh, so there's, there's two answers to that question. One is how long is enough to accomplish your goal. And I know that oftentimes people will take the 
Prilosec and they read on the box that it says that you should never take more than 14 days without, you know, and so people or quote unquote without seeing your doctor. I don't know why that's there. It's some sort of medical legal reason, but usually most conditions, if you need acid suppression, you generally need at least, uh, you know, four to usually 12 weeks to really allow the stomach to repair itself. So that is my regular term, not, you know, quote long term, but some people actually will need to take these medications indefinitely for whatever reason. Um, if they have just a chronic severe gastritis that keeps recurring for reasons we don't understand, um, you obviously, as Dr. Pashinsky said, want to have people on as little medication as possible uh, and try to use as, you know the mildest medications. But there are patients out there that have to be on medications and do take proton pump inhibitors. There's a lot of people who are on them that don't need to be on them, so we often spend a lot of time working to get people off them. But there are people that do have to take them on an ongoing basis. A good example of that is people that have a history of ulcers and uh, on non-steroidals, but have to take non-steroidals. There's actually guidelines saying they have to do it. So it's a very small percentage of people, but some people do take them on a regular basis. And they are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for maintenance and long-term use in those conditions. And um, again, that's a whole other conversation. I personally feel, and I think the data really shows when you look at it, that in those instances, when you have to use them, they are safe to take indefinitely. Excellent answer. Um, I'm going to throw a couple at Susie now, and then we'll come back to you, Tony. So um, as a question about intermittent fasting, um, and how does one intermittent fast uh, when your stomach hurts uh, after three to four days? So I think that's a perfect uh, little segue for Susie and the whole empty acidic stomach um, question. Um, yeah, I mean, the answer is you don't. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, I think intermittent fasting is is an umbrella term, right? So it can look like a lot of different things. Um, there's longer fasting, there's shorter fasting. I would say as a general rule, I don't love any patients with something like acid reflux or gastritis or an active ulcer going really long periods without food because we actually want to buffer that gastric acid, right? So empty stomach, acid stomach, that's not boding super well for intermittent fasting. Um, but again, you know, I hear people interpret the intermittent fasting approach in lots of different ways. Um, but generally, I'm plugging for smaller, more frequent meals through the day. Um, you know, if you really aren't feeling a super great appetite, maybe it's prioritizing something like liquid nutrition or something super soft, but just breaking up the, the food volume into smaller amounts. Perfect. Um, another one for Susie, can drinking too much water irritate the stomach? Not really. No, I mean, you know, it can feel uncomfortable for someone to have lots of liquid volume coming in maybe rapidly, or again, if there wasn't a lot of food and you feel like things are very, fairly sloshy is, you know, kind of the sensation. Um, but water, no, you know, I think that there's a myth about drinking water with meals that you shouldn't be having fluids with meals. I would like to dispel that here now. <laughs> it's okay. Yes, we do want you to drink water. It is a very important thing. Um, uh, a timely question. Um, has long COVID been correlated to increased ulcer incidence? Um, that might be one for Tony here. Um, the answer, the short answer is not to ulcer incidence, uh, but um, I'm sure you'll agree, Dr. Pichinski, we see a lot of people that have had severe prolonged gastrointestinal symptoms after the COVID has gone for reasons we don't understand. And I see a lot of people with tough stomach ache and dyspeptic symptoms afterwards. Um, it's interesting, actually, if you look at the COVID organism and you stain it, actually, there, you know, we always talk about it going into the lungs, but uh, Dr. Mahandru, our institution has done the research with us and shown the amount of burden of COVID in the GI tract is significantly higher than in the lungs. And fortunately, most people don't get super sick from it, but a certain number of people do seem to have uh, prolonged pain and, and GI distress. Uh, fortunately, it's not most people, but uh, I think there's enough of them that we do see them in our practice. And it's an area we're struggling with and not quite sure how to handle yet. Yeah, I mean, think think of um, your gut being kind of your main immune organ. 
and sort of the biggest sort of mucosal immune organ, kind of much more than your sinuses and your respiratory tract almost in a way, and one that is sort of in constant contact with the outside world. So kind of all of those same viruses, um, you know, that tend to affect the respiratory tract certainly affect it and in various ways, uh, but we haven't seen sort of ulcers per se, but certainly lots of different versions of irritation. Um, Susie, a good question for you. Um, is there any benefit to drinking alkaline water to help with reflux? No, there's there's really no no science behind that. Um, really, any water is 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 fine. And there's uh, another thing called you know an alkaline diet, and that's also something that's not really backed by science. So I would probably save your money because some of those products are really expensive. Um, question, you know, a few more questions here, and I'm, I'm trying to, uh, everybody, everybody really jumped in at the end. They were very well behaved before. Um, it, you know, is there any role in doing surveillance of gastritis, uh, for those people who have it, especially if there's any family history, um, of various cancers, particularly stomach cancer, you know, should people be getting regular endoscopies? Um, you know, what would prompt us to consider that in someone? Okay. So there's, certain levels to this thing, uh, to this question. First of all, the family history is, you know, how significant is the family history? Are these like first degree relatives, siblings or parents? Um, are there other cancers involved? Because there may actually be indications of, for really strong family histories to do genetic testing to find these less common conditions where you actually might have to have frequent upper endoscopies. Um, outside of that, you have to remember that a lot of the causes of stomach cancer, in addition to H. pylori, is environmental. People who are smokers, for example, or from areas where stomach cancer was more common. Uh, so a lot of people will tell me, oh, you know, my uncle and my father had stomach cancer. Do I have to worry about it? But they were all heavy smokers and drinkers, and these people have healthy stomachs. And I'm not so concerned about them because it's a whole different generation removed. There are certain findings on endoscopy things called intestinal metaplasia or dysplasia, which are precancerous conditions you might find uh, in the stomach and, uh, and certain autoimmune diseases, such as pernicious anemia, where you might need to have regular endoscopies. Uh, but if you have, even if you had two relatives, relatives um, but they weren't super close relatives or from another generation apart and had other risk factors, if your stomach looks fine, I wouldn't worry about it. So you know, it really depends upon the greater context, not just the, you know, the fact that you had two relatives would be, you know, what other causes could it have been. Also, H. pylori, as I said before, is a risk factor, and those people may have had H. pylori. And if you had H. pylori uh, and you had a family history, I would certainly recommend you get treated for it. Excellent. I'm scrolling through. There was a question specifically since you like um, DGL, Tony, there was a question as to whether that is something that is safe to be used long term, or is this something that should also be a short term treatment? The Generally, uh, it is safe to use long term. Um, the only thing in the caveat is some people, uh, it does promote fluid retention. So if you see that it causes, you know, puffiness or swelling or, or your ankles or your feet, then that'd be something I would avoid using, but otherwise it's it's pretty safe. And I'm just scrolling through to find some interesting stuff. So um, for example, for Susie, um, you know, is five or six hours too long to go between meals because it's like, you know, patient is saying, I can't really eat when I'm not hungry. So it's, what do I do in that case? Yeah, so, you know, Again, that's the individualization piece. How are you feeling, right? I mean, five to six hours is not an unreasonable amount of time, but if you know you have certain symptoms, we might find that you feel better if you're breaking up those fasting gaps. Um, so it's really just dependent on what, what you can tolerate through the day. And there was also a question on any, you know, when people are trying to avoid caffeine or coffee as a major trigger, you know, kind of a question is what kind of teas or other herbal drinks might be much more friendly, um, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's lots. Um, 
most most herbal teas are probably going to be fine for most people at the end of the day, you know, broad statement. Um, but I would also challenge what I say to my patients is like, what is the drink that you would like to tolerate? You know, if it's coffee, maybe we can work on that. Maybe there is a way we can get you to tolerate some coffee. I have nothing against, you know, most people drinking coffee. If, but if you've already exhausted some of the strategies we were talking about, I would say most herbal teas would be fine. You know, keep it fairly simple. Yeah, I kind of my, my thing is always that, you know, taking coffee away from New Yorkers, you know, none of my patients would ever come back, you know, you you kind of, uh, personally, I wouldn't come back because I sort of needed to survive a little bit. Um, and um, I think we are now at, I think we've kind of come up on the hour. Um, so I'm going to answer a couple of these questions, you know, sort of on the chat, but I think we're going to be um, wrapping it up. Oh, one more question for, uh, for Susie here. Um, for, I think this is a good one, just came in. Um, if, you know, you're basically fasting when you're sleeping, so what would be a good first meal? What are good breakfast meals for people who suffer from some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, this is where we want to think about, like, what would be kind of gentle, right? So being mindful of some of the potential triggers, you know, if you're not sure how you tolerate them, maybe it's having just like a small portion of something that's really acidic paired with something that's like generally nice and soft and neutral, you know, things like, uh, you know, simple proteins, eggs, toast, oatmeal, yogurt, like, I wouldn't do anything that you're not really sure how you handle, you know, if you are, if you are typically symptomatic, um, but softer textures um, can be really helpful, things that aren't particularly high fat alone, right, and just look for balance, you know, in the meal, but again, you know, it'll vary, it'll depend, depend on how, how severe your sim symptoms are, um, and what you like to have, you know, I can list a lot of different meals, but I like to work with people like, what, what would you want to have, and do we need to tweak that a little bit to get it feeling good for you? Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for joining us uh, for this chat. And thank you, Susie and Tony, for presenting some wonderful, informative, um, you know, info. And um, this is a recorded session. So if you guys missed anything, it will be um, put up on both our website and our YouTube channel within the next you know, week or so. Um, so you could always catch up, slow things down in case, you know, we, we rushed through anything. Um, and obviously, if you have any particular burning questions, uh, please contact one of your, um, you know, NYGA doctors um, or Susie would be happy to obviously work with you and come up with a more individualized approach um, to your particular needs. So have a wonderful evening, everybody. And good night, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you, especially bellies. Dr. Peshinsky for moderating and doing such a good job answering all the questions. Have, have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye.